I'm saying very expressly that skills, not money, is the currency of the 21st century. But unfortunately, those, this currency has a high degree of inflation. The skills that we have today are not going to be enough for the skills that we will require in the future. Just to give you sort of a brief indication, uh, we have just done, you may be familiar with PISA, we have just done a kind of PISA for adults. We actually tested the skills that people have, no? not the qualifications that they got, that's another question, but the skills they actually have. But at the very same time, you also see that education is not a guarantee. More education doesn't automatically translate into better jobs and better lives. That's the hard lesson many young people learn, particularly during the period of the financial crisis. You can see that in data where we actually surveyed employers, you know, in terms of do they find the people with the skills they need. And actually what you can see, the Czech Republic is actually in a quite favorable position on this, but you can see in many countries there are on the one hand unemployed university graduates on the street struggling to find a job, and at the very same time employers telling us we cannot find the people with the skills they need. If you turn your television on, you look at Egypt, now you see all these unemployed youth graduates demonstrating on the streets. But last year, Egypt had 600,000 vacancies for highly skilled labor they couldn't fill. This is what's going on, and this is why we have to be much better at figuring out what are the kind of skills that drive economic and social outcomes. How do we develop those skills in efficient? equitable ways. This is about relevance, efficiency, equity. How do we actually make good use out of those skills? You know, productivity is always the result of two things. The skills that you develop, the skills that you have, and how well you actually deploy them. And that's precisely what we're looking at when we, for example, test students with PISA, or PIAC, our adult skills. No? This is not about, did you remember what you learned in school, but can you actually extrapolate? Can you transfer what you have learned? We often get criticized for this. People say, well, this is a terribly unfair assessment because it tests young people with things that we haven't taught them in school. No. Well, but then you also have to call life unfair because the test of truth today is not can I remember what I learned in school, but actually can I extrapolate, can I apply? And these changes are really real big changes in the demand for skills. When you think about it, what matters today is your capacity to be creative, critical thinking, judgment, problem solving, ways of thinking. It has to do with ways of working, com communication, collaboration, growing in relevance. It has to do with the kind of tools that we need to work, information literacy. No? Literacy today is about something very different than it was in the past. Chief. In the past, Learning was highly prescriptive. No? We had a very industrial work organization of education. Where, you know, governments figured out what students should learn, handed out textbook, and then teachers were meant to basically use those kind of textbooks. Today, that approach simply no longer works. No? The best performing education systems rely on a very, very advanced profession that actually creates the wisdom of its practice. The past was about looking upwards in the bureaucracy. No? to the school principal, to the government. Today, the test of truth is, can I look outwards? Do I know what the next teacher is doing in my school? Do I know what the neighboring school is doing? Do I know about the professional practices throughout the system? The past was about administration management. Today, it's about leadership, no. building human talent in my school. Is there's a culture that focuses all about on outcomes, no. and there's a culture that focuses all on processes. Both have their merits, but none is sufficient. If you don't do either, well, you know, there's no question about it. You end up in depriving your people. No? Nobody knows where they stand. However, if you just focus on sort of outcome-based management, introducing more tests, more assessment, and so on, without thinking about processes, you end up losing ownership in the profession. You end up with external control, uninformed prescription to people. If you go to the other extreme, you go to just looking at the processes, believing people inspection, evaluating at the, at the qualitative level without looking at the outcomes, you rely on the goodwill of people. There are some countries that are very good at that. Finland is an example. But it's very, very hard to actually replicate this. The key to good and a good assessment culture really is to combine the focus on outcomes with a focus on 
on, 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 on processes. This is where you create this kind of integrated quality management atmosphere that generates quality and trust. The Czech Republic has made enormous progress in strengthening autonomy in the system. You look at the responsibilities that schools had in the year 2000, you look at the responsibilities they have today, a world of difference. But this is a warning signal from our PISA survey. What I'm doing here is actually I contrast the level of autonomy that schools have with the kind of knowledge sharing mechanisms that the system provides. I call that here accountability, but that doesn't mean sort of test-based accountability. That basically means the mechanism an education system has to share and spread knowledge. And you can see the highest performing schools internationally are the ones that have a strong sense of ownership, a lot of autonomy, but that operate within a very, very strong system. The lowest performing schools are the ones that have a high degree of autonomy, but it operate in isolation. So autonomy can actually work for you and autonomy can work against you in a system. The question is not is autonomy good or is it bad, the question is in what framework is school autonomy embedded. And that's very, very important to get right. So the quality of an education system can never exceed the quality of its teachers. Very simple but hard to do. Uh, it has to do with investing resources where they can make most of a difference, attracting the most talented people into the teaching profession. And there are some countries that have become very, very good at that. Finland gets the most talented people into the teaching profession, not because they pay them very well. They're not as badly paid as teachers in the Czech Republic, but not very well paid either. But the work organization is highly, highly attractive. But it has to also with making spending choices. And I just want to show you one piece of data here that shows you basically the red dot is sort of the money that countries invest per student relative to their spending capacity. You know, if the dot is high, basically a lot of your GDP per capita goes into education of students as the dot is low, relatively little. But much more interesting is that countries spend their money very, very differently. The green bar is about salaries. No? Some countries, the Asian countries in particular, prioritize high teacher salaries. No? They pay people relatively well to attract great people into the teaching profession. Other countries say, and that's the blue bar, well, you know, we want to make classes very small. And if you look at the Czech Republic, what makes the system relatively inexpensive are actually below average salaries, and it's also the instruction time. Students don't have the kind of long school days that we have in many other countries. What makes the education systems relatively expensive is that there are lots of teachers for fewer students. When you compare that actually with many of the highest performing education systems across the OECD, you can see that they do exactly the opposite. They may also spend more on education, that's a different story, but they tend to prioritize the quality of teachers over the size of classes. The amount of money that you spend on education only accounts for 20% of the performance differences that we see across OECD countries on PISA. A lot more important is how you invest in the kind of spending choices really make a very important difference. Let's have a look. Finland, you know, makes the teaching profession the second most highest status in the country. The se second profession with the second highest status in the country. They get 10 applications for every open teaching post. Again, not because salaries are good, but because the work environment offers so many opportunities. There are real career perspectives for teachers. They can grow in their careers. There are teacher perspectives for collaboration with other teachers and so on. I spoke with Passi Salberg in Finland, uh, an expert there, about what makes teaching so attractive. And listen to what he said about that. Teaching profession in Finland has always been popular, and this is what I hear in many other countries, that teaching used to be a, f a very popular profession among young people. I think the good question is that how Finland has been able to maintain teaching in a school as something that attracts uh, young people. And I think that what distinguishes our schools uh, from the many other schools is that we have been able to keep teaching profession firstly intellectually attractive and interesting for uh, teachers. In other words, that our teachers, they feel that they can use the knowledge and skills uh, that they learn in teacher education 
um, fully. They have a role in uh, curriculum planning and design. They have a, a very important role in assessing students' performance. The last point I really want to make is about getting the most uh, the best resources into the toughest schools. There's a lot of talent in every education system. How do you mobilize the talent? How do you get the most qualified teachers into the most difficult classrooms? How do you get the best principals into the toughest schools? It's a challenge which many education systems face. It's a challenge very, very relevant to the Czech Republic. According to our data, you can see the large between school variability in the case of your country. How do you actually do that? Some countries have tried to do that with money, you know, paying teachers more for getting into tougher schools. You actually, if you want to do this, you have to pay a lot more money to make a bit of a difference. It's very, very hard to do with money. What well, we have actually found in our comparisons that career incentives are the most promising route to get there. If you structure teacher careers around taking on challenges, that's the most promising route to success. One country that has had sort of a huge impact with this is actually China in the region of Shanghai. You know, if you're a vice principal in Shanghai in a high-performing school, one of those elite schools, and you go to your government and say, I really want to become a principal, they say, well, we can promote you. But first, please show us that you can actually turn around one of the lowest performing schools. So you spend one, two years in one of the toughest areas. You're not alone there. You can actually take some of your colleagues with you. You build a new learning environment. You show that you can actually improve it. And you become a principal. Very, very good at incentivizing people to take on tough challenges. All students can succeed, even in subjects like mathematics, where we believe they are subject to talent. We actually did something very interesting. We asked students, you know, what do you believe makes you successful in a field like mathematics? And you have many students in the Czech Republic who tell you, it's clear, you know, it's all about talent. You know, if I'm not born as a genius in mathematics, I better study something else. No? If you ask the very same question to a Japanese or a Chinese student, nine out of 10 tell you, it depends on me. If I invest the effort, if I try hard, my teachers are going to help me and I'm going to be successful. What does it tell you about an education system? On the one hand, you know, education is about sorting people, those who are actually right to be sorted, they're going to be succeed, the rest not. In the other case, everyone is going to succeed. There's no excuse for failure on nobody's part. No? And that's what the future is about, helping all students to learn at very, very high levels. The second part, I've talked enough about it, I don't need to stress it more, is to move from routine cognitive skills that we believe are making people fit for a lifetime towards learning to learn, to enable complex ways of thinking, to enable complex ways of working, 21st century competences. The challenge is that that requires a very, very different caliber of teachers. If we had met here 100 years ago, we would have asked ourselves, you know, how many people actually do we need to finish school? No? Half of them, 60%, maybe 70%. Today, we raise that same question. The answer that basically that we have in the OECD, as long as we see a rising premium on better skills, as we do today, there's every justification for governments to make a better, or countries, societies, to make a better effort to raise the skills of people. And so far, even up to the middle of the 20, uh, 21st century, we are, we, our best bet is that this trend is going to rise. So we are seeing a dramatically rising demand for better skilled people. Better skills, getting more people skilled up, different types of skills, Many of the kind of policy levers that we have to deal with inequalities are no longer going to work. For example, if you look at the question of inequalities, we see that there are growing income inequalities. How do we deal with them today with taxes? You know, we raise taxes from some, we give the money to others, but we're not going to solve the problem that you could see here, that those inequalities are largely driven by what people are able to do. So up to the middle of the 21st century, you know, I'm we're pretty confident that this is a long-term trend that we are seeing without no obvious end in sight. Technology is going to gain ever more in importance, which, which means, again, you know, you need more advanced skills of people over the time. The, the, the fact is that the 21st century no longer pays you for what you know. It pays you for what you can do with what you know. And that is the kind of skills that actually are going to be very, very different.